Hello, Ingolf. It's a pleasure to be here and to see you again. Hi, Andrew. It's also a pleasure for me. Um, could you tell us a little bit about the ZIAQUAL IMI Consortium and its objectives? Yeah, of course I can. Well, I'm sure everybody knows that when we do research and when we examine the patient's perspective, that's called quality of life research, where we really go and ask the patient about their disease, about how the treatment and how that's directly impacting on them. And we've been doing this for at least the last 10 years in a very systematic and robust manner. If you look back in the literature, you'll see that quality of life research is now done in a very much a standardized way in most clinical trials that are run by academics and industry. However, while we've got better at doing these new standards by creating new tools, by designing new trials and publishing these trials in a standardized way, we still have one major gap. And that's having the standards that will guide us in the analysis of such data. So Ingolf, why do you think funding from the EU Innovative Medicines Initiative is actually so important for this work? First of all, we are very pleased that the EU Innovative Medicines Initiative agreed there is a need and issued a funding call afterwards for researchers from industry and academia to collaborate together, which is very important here. And they want us to create an international consortium of experts whose job it is to fix this problem. And our job as a consortium is to come up with a set of standards for how we can analyze quality of life data in cancer clinical trials. And that trials that are done across the spectrum in both academic and industry setting uh, and sponsored trials. So how did the project start, Andrew? Yeah, interesting question. You see, you and I have always had an interest in how we standardize the work in the quality of life uh, field. And I think our early work, we were able to pull a large group of experts, if you remember, from across different disciplines in different countries. What the IMI funding does, it allows us to expand that group and to include more participants from disciplines and many other countries. We are now very happy to say that we've got a big consortium with more than 41 partners and stakeholders that really represent academics, regulatory agencies such as the FDA, the EMEA and HTA bodies too. And of course, not forgetting critically, patients. So Ingolf, why is the involvement of pharmaceutical industry so important for the Cisco Consortium? Thanks, Andrew. I think the industry does a lot of clinical trials uh, and it's so important to have the perspective of industry uh, because of this and we fund so many trials to support the development of innovative medicines for patients in need and hence all the work packages are co-led by someone representing the public as well as the private side. But more importantly, I'm also very proud that we are also including patient in the consortium to learn about their needs and their specific perspective, since, since we are dealing with the data that is uniquely provided by them. And they are so important that we decided that they also lead a full work package and have been integral also in the designing of the work of the, our consortium. And again, what unifies all of us, regardless of whether we work for regulatory or HEA agencies for academia and industry, is our shared vision that PRO data are more used in actual decision making in the future. And ultimately, and this is our big hope, we hope that these data should inform conversations between doctors and their patients of which treatment is the best for them. Can you briefly describe and uh, the scientific scope of the project and issues that you will be tackling? Yes, so our consortium actually has more than 180 members. We've already met virtually and in person and we started to prioritize our activities. We have researchers that will actually be making guidelines on how we have to analyze quality of life data from randomized clinical trials as well as single arm trials. We have researchers who will be looking at how we should best present that data and how clinically meaningful that data will be. And of course, we have a very important work stream we'll be working on about how to present that data best to patients so patients themselves can really fully and easily understand their data directly themselves. So Ingolf, why have these issues really not been resolved before? Andrew, I think that's a very good question. And we have to say there has been a large amount of evidence provided on all of these topics. Though there's data and papers out there and plenty of them. 
However, these often come from the perspective of one group of stakeholders, for example, such as statisticians, clinicians or psychologists. And we think, of course, this is valuable, but there's no consensus that involved all relevant stakeholders on the best methods to be used under which circumstances and how the results should be presented to all the stakeholders, such as regulators, HTA bodies and clinicians and patients alike. Why is consensus and for among all these different stakeholders so critical to our work? So indeed, as you say, it is indeed critical for the work of the CISICO IMI consortium. What we're going to be doing is pulling together all this evidence, we'll be debating that evidence in a very critical manner. Then, following a really standardized process, we'll be trying to get consensus from across these 41 different organizations. So we'll be trying to do something that's really never been achieved yet. And we're trying to get something done in research in a very standardized and systematic manner. So how is the work of the CISGOL IMI relevant in practicing goals? Well, it's because quality of life, symptom and functional limitation, they are such now a standard endpoint. And we really need doctors, researchers, patients to be confident with the results that we show to them, which means that we should not have near identical trials using very different analysis methods, which we sometimes see in the literature, that they give very different results. And we need now to create standards and guidelines that everyone can fit on a global stage and that can be understood and followed and will give some confidence to researchers, patients and everyone looking at the results of our studies. Andrew, how do you rate the difficulty of providing global standards in the design and analysis of patient reported outcomes? Ah, you see, it may seem on the face of it a very easy project. We're simply pulling existing standards together, we're simply speaking to each other and we're deciding what's acceptable. However, if it was such an easy task, this is, would have been resolved at least a decade ago or even longer. You see, in reality, quality of life is still an evolving science. Now, we've made huge steps in how we create measures. We've got a lot of an agreement on how we design trials. But this is the final major gap that we've got to address. So we have a bunch of world-class stakeholders who have agreed to help, who've taken a great deal of trouble to design our current work. And because of that, I think we are in a very good place to get the end results that we really need. Indeed, and for I think we are confident that we pool the existing data and publications over the coming years. And as we start to have discussion and debate, and that the expert and the consortium will do their very best to come to agreements or consensus on further analysis standards. At the end, we don't have a choice. We have to move on our standards and improve so that the views of patients are given greater weight than ever before in decision making. Well, Ingo, thank you for taking the time today to discuss this as a consortium. It's really been a pleasure. Thanks, Andrew. The pleasure's on my side as well. Well, thanks everybody for taking the time to listen to our video. Please do keep in touch on our website. You'll see that we've got lots of other videos from academics, from the HTA bodies, and even from patients talking about what the CISICO Consortium does. In addition to that, as we develop the guidelines, we'll be putting them on the website, and we'll be encouraging you to comment and give us some feedback. So thank you again for taking the time to listen today. Bye-bye.